Hello and welcome to Rites Chapel. My name is Tanya and I'm the Director of Connection Ministries. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're hoping you'll let us know of your attendance by typing in your name and the name of those worshiping with you in the comments section. This is also a great opportunity to greet one another and to say hello to those who may be new to online worship. If you have questions about Rites Chapel or you'd like to learn more about its ministries, feel free to reach out to me directly at tanya at rightschapel.org. Thanks again for worshiping with us and may God bless you as Clay leads us into a song of praise. Hi, I'm Clay Motley, the music director here at Rites Chapel, and I want to invite you to join us with these next song, or the next song now and the songs coming up later in the service. Sing along wherever you are, just like if you're in the car or in the shower or wherever you would sing out loud. Get those around you to join you too. You'll learn these songs pretty easily if you don't already know. Join us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like
Christ Chapel, it is so good to be with you on this Palm Sunday as we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem and, and as we prepare ourselves for, for Holy Week and, uh, and, and the events to come and, and get ready for, for a celebration of Easter next week. It is so good to be in worship with you. Thank you for making time to worship, to worship our God. My name is Charles. I'm the pastor here at Rice Chapel. Uh, again, thank you. I want to invite you, if you haven't already, to check in to let us know that you're worshiping with us. You can do so by typing your name, the names of any of those uh, who are in the room with you in the comment section. Uh, we also uh, invite you if, you, if it's easier for you, to go ahead and just text Tanya at 540-604-0038. So helpful for us to know who it is that is worshiping uh, with us. I uh, want to also invite you at the end of the service, if, if this has been meaningful for you, to, to, to push the share button and share, help us share the gospel with your friends, your connections, and families. Uh, also, if you are ever in the area, uh, we'd love to have you stop by, whether that is uh, during the week or on a Sunday morning for in-person worship. Um, we just like to make that face-to-face -face connection, so we would invite you to, to do so and, and, uh, and, and greet, greet one another. I want to give a shout out to, to Sharika and Bruce Twiner, uh, their daughter Rory. Uh, they worship with us on, online and uh, looking forward. Rory is, is planning to sing for us next week. That's always a treat uh, for us as well. So uh, just good to have them as part of our, as part of our worship service. This week, um, as we enter into Holy Week, we'll be having services here in person um, on Thursday and on Friday night at 7 p.m. for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. We will also be posting services online on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday as well, um, if, that is, if that works out better, better for you. We've been asking you to think about who, um, who you might invite um, to, to celebrate Easter uh, with you next week. Uh, to be praying about that person. And so this week we want to invite you to, to ask that person to join you, whether that is in person um, in worship or to join uh, online in, in worship with you. And, uh, and uh, if you're in our area um, and want to stop by, we put together these little things just to make that, help make that invitation a little bit easier. It's just a, it's an egg, got a little piece of chocolate, and it got, uh, got an, a, a, an invitation, a little slip that has our worship times for Easter. Uh, let's folks know that we'd love to have them join. If you want to, if you're in the area and want to stop by and pick up an egg or so to invite somebody, they may be in your, maybe living in your house, um, maybe a neighbor, maybe a coworker. Um, hope that you'll use the opportunity just to invite somebody to join uh, for worship. That is uh, um, our connections and, and inviting friends, family to, to join us. That's the number one way, and people begin a relationship with with Christ. Also, just uh, to make you aware that on April the 14th. Uh, we will not be having in-person services. We will be having a potato drop. And so at 9.45, we'll gather together and uh, we'll be bagging up 22,000 pounds of sweet potatoes to give out into the community. We will be having an online service um, that, that Sunday. Um, and so I just want to make you aware of those, those dates coming up. If, uh, if you do have any prayer requests, we'd love for you to share those prayer requests with us. Uh, we have a team of folks that want to be in prayer and ministry with you. And so... Um, let us prepare our hearts as we go to God, as we go to God in prayer. Hi, my name's Abby. Let us pray. Humble Jesus, long ago you rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Today you rise into our lives and you draw near to us. We too rise to greet you and shout our hosannas. You are a great God, a compassionate ruler, a loving friend, and a wise counselor. But deep in the distance, in some far corner of our soul, we fear you, your arrival. You gently offer us a choice. To choose you means letting go of our jealousness and resentments towards against others. Like the people of Jerusalem, we discover you are most more than we first thought. Beyond, beyond our loud hosannas, you ask for our obedience and our worship. And we are learning piece by piece to turn that over to you. On this day and throughout this Holy Week, move us into a deeper level of trust for you. Let us feel again that your pain of that last week. Help us to touch our own wounds and then trust you with them, letting Easter be the sign of a new hope for us. Hear our prayers for all those who suffer from the violence of war. Hear our prayers for the sick and lonely. Touch those who are nearing the death that they have a glimpse of your glory. We ask these in all things in the name of Jesus who taught us to say when we pray, to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, my name is Tinsley. Today I'm reading Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything, you just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took a place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell your daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you. Humble and mounted on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their co- cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let me thank everyone who has helped to lead us in our time of worship uh, this, this morning. Let us pray together. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts Truly be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Any of y'all have a, a recipe that you're kind of you're known for? Uh-huh. Not, not, that, not that you've got your own TV cooking show, but, but maybe in your family there is a, a dish that, that you make that, um, that everybody looks forward uh, to. When, when you're going to make it. And I suspect some of you right now, you're, you're, you're thinking hard, and you're, some of you shaking your head, no, that, that's not you. You don't, you don't like to cook. You're not known for any cooking that you do, any food that you prepare. But, but, maybe, but maybe someone in your family um, is known for 
um, a special dish they prepare. I, I, I go ahead and I invite you just to type in the comment, who's somebody that you know is known for, for what it is? Maybe it's in your family for the dish that they prepare. And what is that dish? Type that in the comment section. I just remember, I remember uh, Mary Ellen Squisher from our church. Uh, uh, Mary Ellen, um, just a, a saint. She died um, several years ago now, but um, she was known in these parts. Uh, she was known for her banana bread. Um, and I'll tell you, that banana bread of hers, it was just, it was so, so good. Uh, when, I, when, I came to, when I came to Virginia a little more than 30 years ago now, I noticed um, that people down here can get real particular uh, about the chili uh, that they make. Everybody, it seems, has a special chili recipe they use. And, and, uh, and, 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 and they've got a couple of special ingredients, right? Sometimes they keep those a secret, but they've got some special ingredients that somehow sets their chili apart from, from all others. Uh, it, it's the same I found down here with, with, um, with homemade Brunswick stew and and what is the recipe for the, for the best stew, right? And, and people can get, quite frankly, we can get worked up about that. Heated arguments over, over whether it's, it's chicken that is supposed to be in the stew or is it or is real Brunswick stew made with squirrel or, or can it be both chicken and, and squirrel? <laughs> when, I, when I was growing up, up in upstate New York, up in the Catskill Mountains, um, uh, we'd have a we'd have a big uh, family reunion every summer uh, over at my aunt Shirley's. Um, my mom had had eight brothers and, and sisters, and so I, I had a, I had a boatload of, of cousins, and and our families would all get together for a weekend in the summer. Uh, just awesome times as I think about those times. Like a lot of family reunions, there was always a big picnic that was was planned, and everybody. Everybody would chip in and, and uh, they'd chip in a few bucks and, and Bud would pick up fried chicken from the corner store and, and he'd get a bunch of hot dogs and hamburgers for the grill. And, and then, and then every, everyone, every family would bring side dishes to share. And, and pretty much everyone, um, everyone knew what everyone was supposed to bring because, because everyone was known uh, for, their, for their specialty. Um, um, Aunt Dory would, would always bring uh, fresh, uh, homemade rolls. Uh, uh, Aunt Leona, uh, it was her brown bread, right? Aunt Dawn, uh, jelly roll cookies. Uh, my Aunt Shirley, she was, she was known for her, for her baked beans and, and her brown sugar cookies. Uh, my mom, um, uh, no, known as Aunt Kay to my, to my cousins, uh, uh, mom always brought potato salad. Uh, Aunt Maxine, macaroni salad. And, and a whole lot of times, my, my Aunt Charlie, she would, she would jump in and, and she would ask, well, well, what would you like me to bring? Uh, I, I can bring something. And, but you see, her, her sisters, um, her sister, they knew. <laughs> and so they, they'd say to her, they'd say, Charlie, Charlie why, don't you plan to bring, why don't you plan to bring paper products? <laughs> That'd be a good thing for, for you to bring. We, we need plenty of paper products. <laughs> Sometimes Aunt Charlie would counter and say, well, I always bring paper products. How, how about I make some extra potato salad? Kay's potato salad never lasts very long. I, I could make some. I'm telling you, those sisters, man, they could be, they could be brutal. They'd say, no, Charlie, don't, no, Charlie, don't you, don't you worry about that. Don't bring, don't bring any potato salad. Kay's got that. It, if you want to bring something else, Charlie, how about, how about chips? Um, we need some store-bought potato chips. You could, you, why don't you bring those? I remember, I remember listening to my mom talk to one of her sisters one time, and they were asking her about her potato salad. What was it that she added? What were the ingredients, right, that, that, that made it so special? And I, I remember my mom kind of whispered to her sister. I mean, she wasn't about to tell all her sisters the secret, it, my mom, mom said, well, it's really just, it's just two ingredients. And two ingredients, I think, set it apart. You, you've got to finely chop the dill pickles, mom said. And, and you really got to add just the right amount of brown spicy mustard. Everything else, mom said, everything else will work out, she said. But those two ingredients, the pickles 
and the spicy mustard are the key to making the potato salad come out right. I'll tell you, the reason, the reason this matters is that it all corresponds to our Christian life. And we all want the right recipe, don't we, to be a really good Christian. And we all struggle with being a really good Christian, and so we're constantly trying to figure out the, the right recipe. And, and the world is of no help because we have some 45,000 different denominations of Christianity on the planet, and all of them have a slightly distant, different recipe. And, and we argue about what the best version is of Christianity. Is it, is it Catholicism? Protestantism, Eastern Orthodox. Some of us we think, well, if we we go there, that church has that church has the wrong recipe. And, and churches have all sorts of ingredients. Some, some baptize only adults, and some baptize babies. And if you're from a church that only baptized adults, and then you find yourself in a place um, that is baptizing babies, well you might begin to think, well, that's, a, that's, an, improper, that's an improper ingredient. You, you can't do that. And, and some, right, some make communion available to all. Some will limit it. Uh, that's part of the recipe. Some churches use real wine, and, and they will tell you that that's a non-negotiable. And if you're using grape juice, then start the fires of hell burning right now. Some recipes include women as a part of the leadership. And, and, and yet you can, you can go to churches less than five minutes from here. And, and they'll tell you that allowing women to be an ingredient in the recipe is not being a good biblical Christian. We all have, we all have, different, we all have different recipes. Some churches, right, some churches will advocate aggressively that their pastor have access to, to a private plane. <laughs> Hear me out on this now. Others will not so much as give their pastor a reserved parking space. <laughs> Clearly, I chose poorly when picking a denomination. <laughs> there are so many recipes, and we argue about them and, and about what we have to do to be a really good Christian. And, and I, I, I see this play out with you all sometimes. And sometimes it's heartbreaking. You'll come to me and you, you, don't, you don't feel like you're a very good Christian. And, and some, of you, some of you have come from a lifetime in another denomination. And yet there's a piece of you that still feels guilty uh, for, for coming here. And, and what you say is that, is that we, really, we really like this place, but we're not sure the recipe is right. And some of you have no confidence at all that you're doing the things you need to do to be a really good Christian. And, and some of you, when you do land the plane and you acquire confidence in who you are spiritually, no sooner do you do that than you encounter a best friend or, uh, on your block or at your work that goes to another church and they tell you otherwise and that your recipe is all messed up. This is the world we live in. So how in the world can we figure out the recipe of what it means to be a full disciple of Jesus. Like my mom's potato salad, I want to suggest that there are two key ingredients. And everything else we add simply flavors our version of Christianity a certain way. But there are two indispensable ingredients. And they come from answering two questions. The first question is, is what have you done with what you have been given? And the second is this. How much have you loved? When I lay my head down at night, I am 100% convinced that the God of the universe is asking, okay, Charles, what have you done today with what you have been given? And Charles, how much have you loved? Those are the two key ingredients, the answer to those two questions. 
Today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we should recognize that we are coming to the end of Jesus' life as we are walking towards the cross this week. Jesus knew that too. And what we find in all four Gospels is that Jesus now begins to share some of the most important lessons of his life. And, and you think about that, that's natural. Uh, as we come nearer to the end, uh, we, we tend to be more intentional about our words and what we share. Uh, there is important information, there is wisdom, there are sentiments that people want to pass on as the end draws near. And we saw this last week as Jesus gathered his disciples around him and Jesus shared uh, some stories. What we said were insider stories, wisdom that Jesus wanted to impart to his disciples before he was gone, his best friends. And, and we read the, the parable of the, of the talents, which really is a story about that first key ingredient and in answering the question, what have you done with what you have been given? Have you gone all in, <laughs> risked it all for Jesus? In Matthew's gospel, Jesus continues with this trend in the last week of his life, drawing his disciples nearer to him in order to share the most important thoughts of his life. But this idea of Jesus' last words, it really is pronounced in John's gospel. And so I want to jump to John's gospel to, today. After, after riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, knowing that he had all power and authority in the world, Jesus leveraged that power and authority not for self-interest, but rather in John's gospel, Jesus gathered his disciples and began to wash their feet. And in doing so, Jesus showed us that the most valuable part of life is how much of it is given away. Jesus modeled for us and reminded us of the importance of that first key ingredient to living a good Christian life is in answering that question, what have you done with what you have been given. Today, though, I want to speak to the, to the second essential ingredient of the recipe. Love. In, in his final days, Jesus tries to explain to the disciples who have come to believe that religion is so incredibly complicated. He's trying to explain to them that it is not. <laughs> We just need to figure out what the most important thing is to being a good Christian. And here's what Jesus says in John 13. Little children, I am, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. That is a really good Christian. See, they didn't, they didn't have the word Christian yet. That, that came much later. What they knew is that there was a name of what it meant to follow Jesus and to try and live your life like Jesus, and it was called disciple. Disciple. And Jesus clarifies all the complexities and all the rules and all the regulations. I give you a new commandment. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And Jesus puts the stake in the ground and says, this is how you know. This is how you know you're using the right recipe. You may remember that earlier Jesus had reduced the recipe from 613 laws in the Levitical code um, down to two. The recipe had been really complicated because if you wanted to demonstrate to God that you were a really good follower of God, then there were 613 regulations. Each one of them over the years gathering and garnering some subcategories of rules. And, and if you followed the recipe, then you knew that you were doing it right. But it was really complicated. And so Jesus reduced all the rules and the regulations down to, to two. And Jesus said in the Gospels, uh, love God with all you got, heart, mind, and soul. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus thought that that would do it. 
But even that seemed a little complicated for them. So in his final lecture, Jesus comes to them one more time. And Jesus says, I, I give you a new command. A new litmus test. Love one another. Well, well how, do, how do we do that, Jesus? And, and so Jesus clarifies. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm not adding another commandment to your already exhaustive list. I, I'm reducing it one more time so that you know unequivocally what the most essential ingredient in your faith is. Love one another. If you don't know what that means, as I have loved you. And I, th and I think Jesus, I think he just looked around the room. And I think he said, okay, Matthew, let, let's, let's talk about you first. Do you remember, Matthew, what you were doing when, when I met you? I imagine Matthew just kind of, oh, yeah, yeah, don't ask. I, I wanted it off my resume. I, w I was a tax collector. That was the worst possible kind of sinner that existed in, in the first century. That's right, Matthew, says Jesus. And what, what did I... What did I do when you told me that you were a tax collector? Yeah, we, we, went, back to, we went back to my house and, and it disrupted everyone because we were eating. We were all eating together with a whole bunch of sinners. Uh, oh, okay, Matthew, says Jesus. Time out, Matthew. What I, want you to, what I want you to do every day of your life from here on out, I want you to distribute grace the same way I distributed grace to you in that moment. That's what I want you to do. And, and I think Jesus looked over at Nathaniel and he said, what, what, about, what, what about you? What do you have? You, you remember when we met Nathaniel and, and you were talking bad about me and talking about, bad about my family. What good can possibly come out of Nazareth? And you were all into, into the gossip and the social media. What, what, did, what did I do with all that, Nathaniel? Well, well, you were forgiving, and you asked me to follow you. Bingo. Stop right there, Nathaniel. For the rest of your life, capture that, and don't forget it. Every single day, the grace I extended to you, I want you to extend to the people who talk bad about you, who talk bad about your family. That's what I want you to do. And I, and I think Jesus went right down the list. John, James, Bartholomew, Peter, Philip. What about you? And what Jesus was trying to convey was that if, that if you'll do it, Matthew, and if you'll do it, John, if you'll do it, Bartholomew, what will happen is that your lives will become so compelling that you'll start to create a community. And even though people may not believe exactly what you believe, they will be so compelled to be around you because of the way that you live. I want you to love the way I loved you. Jesus knew that if they would do that, people would be drawn in droves because Jesus knew that this was the vital ingredient of the recipe. I'm telling you, in this moment, Jesus made the most revolutionary claim because he tells his disciples, your love for me is not going to be demonstrated not by your love for me, but by how much you love one another. This isn't about, do you love me? You are going to show me you love me by loving the people in your life. This is not about how will you show the world that you love God? Because really, you can't always see that. You can falsify that. You can hide that. You can disguise that. But what you cannot deny is the way you love one another. And this was so revolutionary because in that moment you could, in that moment you could very easily feel significantly guiltier about missing church than if you were mean to someone. I mean, if you were mean to someone, it didn't, it didn't really matter. You just, you just roll into church and send up a quick confession, read a passion, say a prayer. And you're like, hey, I'm good to go. And Jesus says, nope. 
Those days are over. This is different. I'm giving you a new command. I'm giving you the one ingredient that discipleship cannot live without. Love one another the way I have loved you. This was the brilliance of Jesus. This is what made Jesus unique. It is what made Christianity unique. And what this means is that in every moment of our lives, in our marriages, in our parenting, with our friends, at our work, with the people we don't like, in every moment we are going to stop and ask this question. In this moment right now, what does love require of me? That's the litmus test. What does love require of me? What does love require of me with the people that I hate? What does love require of me with the people who speak bad about me? What does love require of me uh, with the people who vote differently from me? What does love require of me with, with children who aren't complying and they've gone all prodigal? What does love require of me when, when we face a giant sociological problem that we don't know how to solve? What does love require of me? And, 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 and for, for some of you, if that's too esoteric and you're like, well, well what does love mean? Well, come on, the Apostle Paul explains this at every wedding you've ever been to. <laughs> Remember 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church? You, you know this. Paul explains it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. And on he goes. Uh, okay, so take the word love out and put the word patience in. You don't know what to do. What would patience require of me right now? Love is kind. Okay, you're in an environment and something comes up, just tap the brakes. What would kindness require of me? And, and can I just tell you that we need to stop it with the, well, with the, well, I'm not wired to be patient. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. This has nothing to do with our wiring. Just work through Paul's chapter on love. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not keep score. How about that one? What would not keeping score in this argument look like right now? If we were to embrace this very simple question, it is unbelievable how much transformation could happen in our own relationships and in the world. And this is the deal. I realize, I realize that this may be difficult in our lives to do, but it's not complicated. We just don't want to do it. In fact, it's really pretty simple. But when we get this right, and when the church gets this right, just think of how much hate and stress and animosity and complacency would evaporate. Look, I, I know it feels odd today. It, it, was, it was revolutionary then. And the first disciples didn't get it either. They didn't understand it. But here's the deal. They tried it. They walked out of the room and they said, we don't understand it, but we're going to try it. And because they tried it, they changed the world. And, and I know, I know that it is logical for me and it's logical for you as we process this to think, well, well, how far do I have to push this? You're telling me to love people that I don't like, to love people who have criticized me. How far do I have to push this? I don't know. I don't know. One of the last miracles that Jesus performed was when one of Jesus' bodyguards chopped off the ear of somebody who was going to come to arrest Jesus, to take him to be crucified. And Jesus healed the man. How about that for love? How far do we have to push this thing called love? I don't know. The preacher Andy Stanley said one time that when the God of the universe answered that question, it cost him his son. And when his son answered that question, it cost him his life. Jesus said, love one another the way I have loved you. Whether or not we're a really good Christian is demonstrated 
and authenticated by our love for other people. How do I know that? Because Jesus commanded his disciples to take the ultimate ingredient and to carry on the message of his grace. In this, in this week ahead, this week that we call holy, are you willing to just try it? And I get that we might not fully understand it. But are we willing to try like crazy? To honor this new commandment? And to love the people in our lives the way Jesus loved us? If we can get this right, if we can get it right, I'm telling you, we will have at our disposal the best spiritual potato salad ever. And so let us go in peace to love one another the way Christ loved us. Peace and amen. Again, let me just say uh, thank you for the gifts you give to the life of our church that just allow us to do uh, so much, much ministry in, in the name of Christ. And um, it was great to be with our youth on Thursday night as they gathered here. And I think we had about 25, 25 young people here with us. And, and Sean had set up in the Fellowship Hall uh, um, uh, uh, seven stations of the seven last words of Christ. And, uh, and, and the kids went through each station. They got in little groups and they went through each station to, to learn the story of, the, of Jesus upon the cross and the events of this Holy Week. And and, and I thought that's what, we're, that's what we're called to do, to share the stories of our faith, to share um, that with, with young people. And, and a lot of our kids are not engaged in, in uh, young people, aren't, their families aren't engaged with the church, but they come on Thursdays. And, uh, and we're learning this week about Jesus' passion, uh, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection out of his love for us, of how we are called to love one another. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the gifts you give, the, th uh, the monies that you, that you send in, that you mail in, that you text in, that you send in online. They make a difference as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ um, with all those in our community. Thank you for what you do. And now receive this benediction, this blessing, and Clay will lead us into a final song of praise. That we might go forth into this world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good and render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor every person. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the powers of the Holy Spirit. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts, our minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. And bring your shame, bring your guilt, and bring your pain. Don't you know that's not your name? Oh, you will always be much more than me. Every day I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right. 
says that it doesn't matter Cause the girls already won the war I am learning to run freely Understanding just how he sees me And it makes me love him more and more